Kate, thank you very much for that very kind introduction, and thanks to everyone for turning out this evening. Um, I'm really very excited to be here, but before I get started, I especially want to thank uh, Provost uh, Stephen House, who's here somewhere, <laughs> and for, for being here and for his leadership here at Elon. And I also especially want to thank Elaine Durr, who's the Director of Sustainability, who has been making sure I was very well looked after today, and, uh, and for all the people who have had to endure uh, sessions with me as students and have to do it again, my apologies, so thank you. It was a very great honor for me to work for so long at the Environmental Protection Agency. And to be sure, there were some days that were better than others. Bill Ruckelshaus, who was the EPA's first administrator and who I'll come back to at the end of this presentation, told a story once and he said, um, he said some days his job felt like the fellow who came home from school and said, mother, I'm not going back to school anymore. All the teachers hate me. The students make fun of me, and even the janitor looks into my room and makes faces at me. And his mother said, son, you have to go to school. First of all, everyone expects you to be there. Second, you're 42 years old. <laughs> and third, you are the principal. Because this talk is about the future of environmental protection, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about the present of environmental protection, though I admit it is tempting. I do, however, want to say a word about the worst political metaphor ever invented, drain the swamp. <laughs> now, not only is it a bad metaphor, it's an insult to swamps. <laughs> After all, swamps perform many useful functions. You would think from this slogan that all swamps that are good, all that swamps are good for are exotic creatures, or mosquitoes, or getting lost on long journeys. But swamps are actually nature's kidneys. They clean nutrient pollution from water and make it available as food for fish, amphibians, birds, and other creatures up the food chain, including us. Swamps prevent flood damage, they can buffer the impacts of hurricanes, and they store water in times of drought. So my argument is, in fact, we have drained too many swamps already. Now, counting Alaska, more than half of the estimated 220 million acres of US wetlands have been degraded or destroyed. So we need more swamps. It was Republican President George H.W. Bush who instituted a policy of no net loss of wetlands in the United States. So draining the swamp means polluting more. I think the metaphor the current administration was looking for was more about treating sewage. Now, since the administration has said that they're in favor of upgrading infrastructure, perhaps there are some useful analogies you can make with this metaphor. But I would simply note that in sewage treatment, just as in most other aspects of pollution control, the first principle that you usually apply is source reduction. OK, so now let's turn to the topic at hand. It's hard to believe that it's been over a year since I left EPA. And the intervening time has given me a chance to gain some perspective on my experience and on what has happened since then. Now, I will not mince words. It is pretty obvious that the policy objective of some within the current administration is to destroy EPA. When you propose to cut the staff by 20% and the budget by over a third, when you propose to cut grants to states by 45%, when you're OK with science advisors who are sponsored by industry but find that independent scientists with grant funding have a conflict of interest, when your regulatory agenda is to undo everything the previous administration did, when you do not consult with agency scientists about lifting restrictions on pesticides, but you consult closely with the manufacturers of those chemicals, when you say you want to get back to basics, but weaken EPA's enforcement capabilities, and on and on and on, you are pretty much trying to destroy the agency. Now, I should note a few things. First, 
So far, Congress has not gone along with these draconian budget proposals. EPA's never had enough money, but this year at least, Congress kept EPA at basically level funding for its operations and actually added about $650 million for water and sewer funding. Now, I will say that I read in the press, you keep hearing, hearing these word, the word rescission coming up, so eternal vigilance is the price of maintaining the status quo. But um, for the moment, at least, Congress has, has kept these cuts from taking effect. Secondly, not every idea is a bad idea. For example, finding ways to streamline agency operations or ways to build a stronger partnership between state and federal environmental agencies or ways to invest more in infrastructure are all ideas that are worth pursuing. They're not new with this administration, but that's okay. The rebranding of good ideas is something that happens in every administration. And here's one example. The Brownfields program um, was one that was designed to help areas make productive use of property that is not so contaminated as to make it a Superfund site, but is still an area of concern. And the picture I have here is of Atlantic Station, which is in Atlanta. It's on the site of a former steel mill, a 138-acre site. After a $2 billion investment, it's one of the drivers of economic growth in Atlanta. And um, it, again, this is what you're looking at now in that picture used to be a steel mill. This is a program that was started in the Clinton administration and but was fully embraced by the subsequent Bush administration. And it's now one of EPA's most popular programs. Now, I will say that I don't think Administrator Pruitt, and certainly none of the next tier political appointees, believe that their intent is to destroy EPA. Although I do think the administration is very responsive to its supporters in the oil and coal industry. But that leaves us with a question. So what does Administrator Pruitt mean when he says he wants to take EPA back to basics? What he appears to mean is that he believes that the previous administration's efforts to address the problem of global climate change went beyond the proper mission of the agency. Now, the arguments used to support this view vary from time to time. Some days, it seems to be because the administrator doesn't believe climate change is happening, or if it is, maybe that's a good thing. Some days, it is a legalistic argument that the Clean Air Act doesn't really give EPA the authority to address climate change, never mind that the Supreme Court has already said that it does. I would simply note that if the administration really believed this last argument, all they have to do is to remove their objection to allowing the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals to rule on the lawsuit that they heard in September 2016 on the Clean Power Plan, and we'll find out for sure. But for, what, for whatever reason, the administration's argument seems to be that if only EPA hadn't gotten so distracted by trying to combat climate change or by trying to protect upstream waters instead of just applying the Clean Water Act to water that's big enough to float a boat in, that if only EPA hadn't done those things, it would be more effective in addressing something else. Now, what something else is, is a little less clear. For example, while the administrator has talked about cleaning up Superfund sites, you didn't see any more money in the administration's budget proposal for Superfund, although Congress, to its credit, put in a little more in the 2018 appropriation. You also didn't see any conversation about restoring the tax that used to provide a steady stream of funds for cleanups, uh, cleanups particularly of orphan sites where you didn't have a responsible party. And oh, by the way, you also haven't seen support for enforcement to bring responsible parties at Superfund sites to the table. The administrator has also said that he wants to improve the state-federal relationship, and again, this is nothing new. Every incoming administration proclaims this as a desirable goal. The concern here, and it was magnified by the executive order the president issued last Friday, is that the administration really wants to enable industry to take their best shot at states for weaker pollution controls with the assurance that EPA won't get in the way. Every previous administration, going back to President Nixon, and responsible state leaders all around have all recognized that a strong EPA can keep weak pollution control 
from being an incentive in recruiting business. Though happily, I must say, I don't think this problem is as serious as it was 50 years ago. But I also have to note that in this administration, deference to states seems to be a one-way street. Um, you may have seen in the press that uh, two weeks ago, EPA said that it would weaken automotive standards for, car and for emissions of carbon dioxide, despite the insistence by California and other states to retain the tighter standards now in place. California has a special provision in the Clean Air Act to allow them to have tighter standards, but the administration has implied that it will fight California if it tries to do this. Um, deference to states, mm, maybe not so much. The administration has also talked about improving infrastructure. And this too, again, is nothing new um, other than perhaps a promise to, quote, streamline, unquote, projects, which may be a code word for cutting corners on environmental reviews. There are some new financing mechanisms available, and they are helpful. But these new mechanisms leverage investment by others, and they don't address disadvantaged communities that are having trouble finding financing now. These communities don't have the ability to raise their own capital or even to repay zero interest loans that are available under existing state revolving loan fund programs. Flint, Michigan will not qualify for these kinds of incentives. Instead, what we have is a trillion and a half dollar tax cut that will make it even harder to sustain the infrastructure funding we now have. Now I say this not out of a sense of doom and gloom. In fact, there is much to be proud of. For those of us of a certain age, it is a source of great satisfaction to look back at the accomplishments we have made since the first Earth Day in 1970. In the late 1960s, many cities in America, Los Angeles, New York, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, Birmingham, Chattanooga, Houston, Dallas, San Francisco, Chicago, um, you get the idea were subject to choking smog. You think about Beijing now, you can think about Los Angeles then. Cities across America were also treating their sewage poorly. Industries were treating America's rivers as open sewers. Toxic chemical wastes were being dumped in the back 40. We had far less assurance that drinking water was safe. Lead was being released into the air from cars and smelters. And lead-based paints brought this threat into homes across America and pesticides were threatening to make Rachel Carson's Silent Spring a reality. We've made remarkable progress on all of these threats. Now, we still face more enormous challenges, but it's worth it for us as a nation to recognize that we have done great things as a result of a lot of hard work by many, many people. So I won't, and I won't dwell on this much longer, but I do want to show one chart as an illustration of the progress that has occurred. Um, if you can see this, you probably can't read this chart from the back, but what it shows is above the, uh, the line in the middle at zero percent, it shows how things have increased and reflects the enormous accomplishment of separating pollution from economic and population growth. You know, back in the old days, billowing smokestacks were used as a sign of economic prosperity. But since 1980, America's economy, as measured by gross domestic product, has increased by more than two and a half times. Our population has grown by 42%. We use 25% more energy, and we drive more than twice as many miles. And yet, we as a nation emit less than a third of the air pollution than we did in 1980. Think about it. If that isn't a measure of success, I don't know what is. And so the question before us is not only whether we can sustain that record of progress, but whether we can build on it in meeting challenges now facing us that we didn't know we had in 1980, or that at least were not widely understood back then. And one example of such a challenge is Lake Erie. And the point of this chart is that in the 1960s, Lake Erie was considered a dead lake, with eutrophication resulting from urban and industrial dischargers, stormwater and agricultural runoff, and pollution coming downstream from Lake Huron. But this changed as a result of the 1972 Clean Water Act that required controls on cities and industries, reduced phosphorus pollution from products like detergents. And as a result, conditions in the lake improved during the 1980s and into the early 1990s. 
However, since 2008, conditions in Lake Erie have deteriorated. Large harmful algal blooms have threatened habitat, fisheries, recreational use of the lake, commercial fishing, and drinking water supplies. These blooms are particularly harmful when they are dominated by cyanobacteria, or blue-green algae, which can produce toxins that can cause gastrointestinal upsets, rashes, and that elevated levels can be fatal to many organisms. The traditional approach to such a problem was to ban phosphates and detergents, to compel cities to build additional waste treatment facilities, and to require industries to put on stringent pollution controls. But the problem is that we've done all those things, and yet we still have a problem. There seems to be no silver bullet solution. Urban stormwater, runoff from agricultural uh, activities, and even atmospheric deposition of nitrogen are thought to be the main problems, the main causes of problems like this that we still have today. So what does this say about, this kind of dilemma say about the future of environmental protection? Lake Erie is not unique. Across the country, there are places where the impacts of pollution are still sadly obvious, where despite nationwide improvements in air quality, people are still exposed to levels of air pollution that raise concerns about their health, or where toxic substances, which are the legacy of past practices, still raise concern about drinking water quality. Some communities find themselves in these predicaments because they have not had either the opportunity or the resources to address problems that have been solved in other communities. These issues, and these issues are not just limited to the United States, they come up all across the globe. So what should we do? It's a question with a long history, and we've tried several models, and here are a few of them. The first is what you might call the laissez-faire model. And that's defined as letting individual actors or firms manage their own environmental affairs subject only in the common law model to tort litigation. And the opportunities associated with this model are freedom and flexibility for the individual or for the firm. The problems with this model are, is first the classic economic argument of externalities. And externality is defined by economists as an upward shift in cost curves for everyone other than the producing entity. For those of you who are not economists, what that means is that polluting industries or purveyors of social inequity or oligopolistic producers, for that matter, can make things lucrative for themselves by imposing costs such as poorer health on the rest of us. And that's not all. When resources are limited, as all resources ultimately are, Laissez-faire results in the destruction of the resource, a dilemma described by economist Garrett Hardin in his famous 1968 essay, The Tragedy of the Commons. And the reason it's a tragedy is because everyone acting in their own self-interest destroys the resource needed by all. Most economists agree that externalities require some kind of group action, and for group action, government institutions are necessary. And the question then becomes, government by whom and how? One answer to this question in the United States was a second model, which relied on state and local authorities. With, no, with a few notable exceptions, this was the model that was relied upon in the United States through the 1960s. And the model's strengths include the ability for states to try different approaches. Um, as Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis famously stated in 1916, the ability for the states to be laboratories of democracy. Pollution control in the United States has been well served by certain aspects of this model. I mentioned California earlier, and California has in fact been a leading laboratory because of the terrain and, and the, um, the explosion of automobile traffic in Los Angeles produced a legendary amount of smog. California imposed emission control requirements on cars ahead of the rest of the country and many other pollution controls were also pioneered there in California. But this model has its problems as well, four in particular. First, California is a big state with significant resources. It's kind of unlikely that smaller, poorer states 
can establish the same kind of pollution control infrastructure. There's also an inefficiency in this model, both from the standpoint of having to duplicate capabilities in every state, and for businesses engaged in interstate commerce who find themselves beset by a bewildering and potentially inconsistent variety of standards from state to state. Nor is this all. Pollution problems give notoriously poor respect to state lines. The classic, although the far from only example of this, occurred in the initial implementation of the 1970 Clean Air Act amendments. To comply with that act's, mandate, that act's mandate to meet air quality standards in local areas, electric utilities built very tall smokestacks to send the pollution into the upper atmosphere. That solved the local pollution problem, but it created acid rain in downwind locations. Not such a good idea. And finally, the pure state and local model created the opportunity for a race to the bottom as states compete for economic development. In theory, states could use the discounting of pollution control requirements or the promise of lax enforcement as a means to attract industry. Now, how much this actually occurred in practice is hard to determine, but sometimes the story outweighs the reality. Only one example or even one perceived example is enough to create opposition in some states to stronger pollution control requirements. And this led to the third model, the dominant one in the United States since the late 1960s and then the creation of EPA, uh, and you can describe it as the national command and control model. And the strengths of this model are its ability to promote consistent nationwide standards. By having a single national regulatory entity, it's possible to centralize expertise, which will be enough to independently examine and challenge information presented by regulated industries. It also creates the ability for government to have sufficient legal expertise and legal resources to challenge well-funded efforts to delay the implementation of pollution controls and to ensure that controls can be enforced through the federal courts. But even with these advantages, problems remain. The national command and control model can be rigid, inflexible, and resist innovation. It's never possible, even for the national government, to have access to all the information you'd like to have. And this means that opportunities for improvement or even critical flaws in the regulatory scheme can be overlooked. And that creates inefficiencies and unnecessary costs in implementation. Moreover, it's the essence of a one-size-fits-all solution. Uh, the only way to avoid the one-size-fits-all solution is to create exceptions. But when you start creating so many exceptions that it seems like the exception is more the rule than the rule, this shows that you have a very complex system that can be very hard to understand. Now, there's one subset of the um, command and control model that I wanted to particularly highlight here, and that is the uh, something called technology forcing. It deserves a special mention. Um, and the most vivid example of technology forcing was, again, the 1970 Clean Air Act, which set a requirement for a 90% reduction in automobile pollution by 1975. Remember, this is only five years, from 1970 to 1975. And it did so even though there was no commercially available technology at the time to achieve it. Um, and the result of this mandate were the first efforts to meet it resulted in cars that were not very satisfying to drive, as any of you who owned a car manufactured in like 1972 through 1974 may recall. But um, the mandate did have the effect of promoting innovation, particularly the catalytic converter, which when combined with computer control precision fuel injection, ultimately made it possible to go far lower than the standards. But it didn't do so right away. The 90% reduction goal for nitrogen oxides was not achieved until 1994. Which reminds me, though, of a funny story, uh, which was that when the 1970 Act was passed and had this strong requirement, um, the general response of the industry at that time was, this is crazy, you can't do this. To even have a chance of this requirement, why, you would have to have a computer in your car. And as, you can, as I can see by your laughter, you recognize that everybody who came here in a car came here in a car with a computer in, and you don't think twice about it.
which goes to show you that one of the great things about pollution control is it stimulates innovation. And innovation can make possible things that used to seem impossible. So that now you have 90, you have 99 percent plus pollution control on automobiles. It's a tremendous accomplishment. And that leads me to a fourth model, market mechanisms. In this model, there is a target for total loading of pollutants into an ecosystem, but rather than have the government make the decision of who can release what, in this model, there is a mechanism for all who contribute to pollution to bid for the right to release this pollution into the ecosystem. These market mechanisms provide, in, promote innovation because they reward firms who can develop the most cost-effective means of reducing their pollution. An added bonus is that with this model, targets can be changed over time as you learn new information about the impacts of pollution or as you learn new information about what controls might be available. And the usual example of the most outstanding application of this model are the acid rain requirements in the 1990 Clean Air Act amendments, although there are other examples as well. But like the other models, it also has potential problems. And the basic problems are that to function effectively, this model requires a certifiable means of tracking permits to emit. The model requires a market clearing mechanism to facilitate trading. And it also requires vigilance and enforcement to prevent fraud. The acid rain amendments, to go back to the, uh, the example I mentioned, worked because there were a limited number of sources that were subject to the requirements. And you also had continuous emissions monitoring technology, which developed just in time to give you some assurance that emissions that were being, um, were being reduced were actually being reduced. And the, diff the importance of these can be seen by the difficulties people have had in instituting a water pollution trading system. There are some pilots out there, but it's turned out to be pretty difficult to meet both those conditions. How do you identify what the sources are, and how do you monitor whether releases, especially from non-point sources, are actually occurring? Now, there is a fifth, and, and while there are other models, I'm only going to inflict five on you tonight. Um, the fifth and final model is that of reliance on informed consumers. And the essence of this model is the belief that given appropriate information, consumers able to make informed choices will tend to create pressures to improve environmental performance. And there are two examples of, of, of this. The first are ratings models, such as Energy Star, Water Sense, or the Safer Choice programs. Uh, these are programs aimed at products to try to tell you what products meet a certain standard and are better from an environmental standpoint. Another pretty well-known example is the Green Building Council's lead system for rating commercial buildings. Uh, this model has proliferated now with systems for everything, uh, not just these examples, but you have systems now for rating all sorts of stuff, all the way from uh, forest products to investment portfolios. There's even an industrial model, the Toxics Release Inventory, that to this day reports on releases to air, water, and land from facilities around the country. These rankings are all kind of variants on the laissez-faire model with the proviso that it provides one thing that proper laissez-faire is supposed to provide anyway, which is information transparently available to the consumer. And many of these programs have caught on, have caught popular imagination. Energy Star is one of the most widely recognized brands in the entire country. And the appeal is just that, that they empower us, each of us as consumers, to make our own choices. Now, these models don't carry enforceable requirements other than in the TRI version, you have, you're, you're required to report. And, but no one is going to make you construct a lead-related building, a lead-rated building, or to buy an Energy Star refrigerator, or to buy an Energy Star light bulb, or a safer choice product, even if it's in your own best interest to do so. Nobody's going to make you. There is one other variant on this model about information which does have more regulatory push behind it, and that is the pesticide program. And, pes and I'm sorry for the fuzzy label here. That's a function of my poor PowerPoint skills, not a fuzziness of the label itself. But in the pesticide program, the label gives directions. If you've ever used a pesticide, a product that makes pesticidal claims, you'll see a label on it. And it gives directions on the use of the product. 
The added incentive is that it is illegal to use a product in a way that's inconsistent with its label, and you can be fined or even imprisoned if you do so, and if you get caught. And this, so this hybrid blends the command and control model and the informed consumer model. But except for large commercial operations, I have to say, these labels are very difficult to enforce, and you're basically relying on people to do what the label tells you. And when they don't, tragedy can result, for example, in the case where a pesticide that was supposed to be used only outdoors was used indoors, and people died as a result of that exposure. So, um, so you have to watch out. So every model that I pointed out has some challenges associated with it. And that leads to the question of what now? I personally do not believe that the current period of federal government hostility to the values of environmental protection will endure. But when it ends, there is going to be some rebuilding to do. And so which of these, which of these models or which of other possible models should direct our thinking about the future of environmental protection? Okay, and, and the answer is pretty obvious, and that is all of the above. And it's all of the above depending on circumstances. How important is it, for example, that you be exactly right, or is close enough good enough? Does it matter if people in different places do different things? Is your system allow you to adapt if new information gives you new opportunities or new insight? How important is it for a particular model to be accepted generally by the public? How much does it depend upon consumer behavior? And you can have the best technology in the world to clean up your Superfund site, but if you can't convince the neighbors that this technology will work, you are going to have a tough time. Now, I spent a couple of years working at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta. And EPA and CDC are similar in size and budget, although there are many other differences. So when I got back to EPA, people asked me, what's different about working at CDC as compared to working at EPA? And what made it challenging for the agencies to collaborate? My one sentence response was that CDC is run by doctors and EPA is run by lawyers. And I tell this story because I believe that in the future, EPA will have to become more like CDC. And that's not become like CDC in structure or form or that the EPA administrator should be a doctor. And it also doesn't mean that we don't need lawyers. So all the lawyers in the room should relax here. <laughs> but the reason is because to be effective, the EPA of the future should be more like a good doctor performing a diagnosis. The job is to have a clear understanding using the best science available of exactly what the problem is and what the leverage points are to enable you to best address it. Let me repeat that because that's important. To understand what the problem is using the best science and to understand what leverage points will enable you to best address it. Now the other part of the doctor's job is to have as many tools in his or her medical bag as possible. The tools will not look like this picture. But I put this up there to illustrate the point that with a, with a large variety of tools in your, in your medical kit, if you will, you can fit the treatment to the diagnosis rather than use one cure for all illnesses. When people only have one tool, they tend to use it no matter whether it's the right tool for the job. Or in other words, if all you've got is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And when you give up tools for ideological reasons, you weaken your potential influence. Even voluntary tools can be useful, especially in places that are suspicious of government authority, where if you walk in and say, I'm from the EPA and I'm here to help you, you will shut down communication with your first sentence. And this is not a problem limited to only one political party. For example, EPA once had a program known as Performance Track, which EPA used to convene businesses to share information and explore environmental solutions that went beyond compliance. And unfortunately, 
This was abandoned by the Obama administration because they were afraid of the perception that EPA was becoming too close to regulated entities. Yet these same entities could help share information with other businesses to help reduce pollution more cost effectively. The Obama administration also abandoned a program whereby EPA had deferred the designation of cities that were almost, but not quite, in attainment of the National Ambient Air Quality Standard for ozone. The incentive was for these communities to take action on their own if EPA would defer designation for three years, and then if in three years it turned out they were still in non-attainment, the designation would proceed and nobody would argue about it. And it turned out that fear of designation was an even more powerful motivator than designation itself. All of these areas, including several right here in North Carolina, now meet the ozone standards. On the other hand, sometimes you really do need the hammer. And I think all I need to do to illustrate the point is to say the word Volkswagen. Here are some of the characteristics that I believe environmental protection of the future will have to possess. The first is high quality, independent science. This is going to be especially important because of something that's on the horizon now, and that is the growth of citizen science. Environmental monitoring technology used to be the province of a very few, but the day is coming when your iPhone will be able to give you environmental readings right where you are. This is going to provide valuable information, but it will raise a whole host of complex issues. And a future EPA is going to have to have the competence and the trust to help this data become useful, understandable information. A future environmental protection system will have to combine strong national standards with both a regional presence and strong supported networks of relationships with state agencies. And this is where rhetoric of saying you want it will not be enough. Government will need to put its money where its mouth is to build these connections. A future system will need to use adaptive management. Adaptive management enables new information to be incorporated quickly into existing strategies for environmental protection, ones that are working and ones that are not working so well. You've got to have a feedback loop. Future environmental protection will need strong enforcement, strong enforcement tools, sensibly applied by both state and federal authorities. You've got to have some guarantee in performance. A future environmental protection system will need something called convening capacity because this doesn't normally appear on lists like this. I want to describe a little what that is. Because many environmental problems are not simply just environmental problems. And to be effective in the future, environmental protection will need people who can speak in ordinary language if they are going to be effective as conveners. The most effective remedial project managers in the Superfund program were not just good engineers, they were people who could listen to community concerns and make sure those concerns were indeed truly heard and addressed. And in, I believe that in the future, community power will continue to grow. And there's an asset there. People protect what places that they know and places that they love. That is a place where environmental protection in the future can take advantage of something that is strong and that all of us share. Finally, the future of environmental protection will need partnerships with businesses because business roles are changing, and I want to say just a word about that in more depth. Signs of this development on and changes in business roles and relationship are really all around us, and that is a tremendous change from 50 years ago. And here are a few recent examples. BlackRock, Vanguard, State Street and Schroeder's PLC, among other investment firms, have all raised concern about the economic risks posed by climate change. In his recent annual letter, BlackRock CEO Larry Fink said, quote, that to prosper over time, every company must not only deliver financial performance, but also show how it makes a positive contribution to society. And it's worth noting that BlackRock has over $6 trillion of assets under management. 
So that's the kind of thing where usually if you get a call from somebody who's managing $6 trillion of assets, you usually answer the phone. The Financial Stability Board's Task Force for Climate-Related Financial Disclosures called on companies to promote clear and consistent climate-related disclosure, such as a firm's vulnerability to increased pricing of carbon emissions or changes in precipitation patterns. I mean, in other words, if your facility is located in a place that will be flooded with high rains, like Houston, you need to account for this risk. Walmart has announced a goal to reduce greenhouse emissions, greenhouse gas emissions in its China value chain by 50 million metric tons by 2030. And that's equivalent to the emissions associated with the average annual electricity, annual electricity consumption of 40 million Chinese households. But that's not all, it's part of a larger goal. And the larger goal, Walmart refers to as Project Gigaton. And that's for Walmart to work with its suppliers to reduce emissions in its global value chain by one billion metric tons, or gigaton, and do that by 2030. Just for comparison, that is like making 80% of the cars in the United States now disappear. And one of my favorites, Hershey Company, plans to spend $500 million through 2030 on making its KISS more sustainable. Hershey aims to increase shade-grown cocoa and in child labor in cocoa production. They'll initially focus on their top producers in the Ivory Coast and Ghana, but they're committed to source 100% of their cocoa from certified and sustainable producers by 2020. Now, before we get too carried away here, I do recognize that none of these are perfect examples. And just to criticize my own slide, I'll note that BlackRock in particular has been called out for holding large shares in large fossil fuel companies and in palm oil producers. And most of BlackRock's funds are passively managed, and only 1.5% of their actively managed U.S. mutual funds explicitly incorporate sustainability as part of their investment strategy, to which my point is, there is a lot of room for improvement. But the fact that companies all around the world want to present themselves as protectors of the environment does represent a change, even if they, and we all, do not fully live up to these ideals. And many companies are also finding, sometimes to their surprise, that what is good for the planet can also be good for business. So I want to close with a couple of stories that touch on future models of environmental protection. And the first is a case that I observed in Georgia. And for this, I'm going to need a prop. Georgia, like North Carolina, has a vertically integrated electric power company which had run utility policy in the state for decades. Though there was an independent public service commission, it was unheard of for the commission to act at variance with Georgia Power's preferences. Georgia Power was a very traditional utility with a heavy investment in coal-fired power plants, as well as in the only two new nuclear power plants now under construction in the United States. However, in July 2013, the Public Service Commission of Georgia voted three to two to impose a 525 megawatt solar power mandate on Georgia Power, something that the utility and its supporters, including the Koch brothers, had vigorously opposed. This occurred because advocates for solar power recognized that they needed to reach out to new allies. In this case, the Georgia Tea Party. Members of the Tea Party tend to support actions that lead to greater personal independence and they were uneasy with large institutions and not just government. And this led to the formation of the very cleverly named Green Tea Coalition. <laughs> and Debbie Dooley, who was the head of the Tea Party in Georgia, vocally aligned herself with solar power advocates, which she continues to do to this day. But there was another factor as well. And it was that the advocates for solar power developed a personal relationship with one of the public service commissioners who provided the key vote to impose the solar mandate. His name is Lauren McDonald, but he is universally known by his nickname, Bubba. <laughs> 